Fear is one of our common traits uh, in our lives. It's, it's what a three-year-old feels in a thunderstorm and why they want to crawl, crawl in bed with mom and dad. It's what a teenager feels the first day going to a new school. Or I remember, uh, I think I was in seventh and eighth grade, and back when we had the old rotary phones, if, for those who remember what they were, and I uh, wanted to call a girl on this phone to talk to her. And I would, you know, the numbers had seven numbers, so I'd dial the first six, hold that seventh number against the clip, trying to talk myself into letting it ring. I'd let go of it and hit the disconnect <laughs> because I was scared to death to talk to a girl over the phone. As we move into adult world, our fears increase rather than diminish. Relationships have become deeper and more intimate. We possess more things that we could lose. Uh, we accumulate more challenging experiences in our lives. And before we know it, that our fears begin to take over more and more territory in our lives. And it's, fear is not logical. You can tell yourself until you're blue in the face that air travel is safer than your car, and it is. But you won't get on an airplane, but you'll get in your car. See, it, doesn't, it doesn't follow the numbers. It's not logical. And fear is impatient. It wants relief, and it wants it yesterday. And it'll grab at anything that promised to lessen the fear. What it wants, it wants relief now. And it stalks us. Will we have enough money for retirement? Will students at my new school like me? Will your spouse relapse? Will the cancer treatment work? Will I ever be able to get pregnant? If I lose my job, will I get hired again? What's the world going to look like for our children or our grandchildren? And we've been studying Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, and we said that the writer, commonly considered and with, with good reason to be Solomon, although the evidence isn't conclusive at Solomon, and so we've identified the writer of Ecclesiastes as he identifies himself as simply the teacher. And the teacher, again, would sit down with us with our fears and he would say, I understand it. I get it. And one of the things that drives our fears is this kind of reality in our heads that there's a lot in our lives we care about that we can't control. We want to live with the illusion that we can control it, but it's just outside our grasp, and we can't. And the teacher comes alongside us and says, I understand that fear. So we're going to let him unpack that, and then we're going to see, well, okay, how does the Bible then lead us through the fears we have over things we can't control? So if you bring up the first slide, if you've got Ecclesiastes in hand, we're going to start in chapter 7. Uh, and the way Ecclesiastes is, is structured, it's difficult to start in chapter 1 and go all the way to chapter 12 and just follow it in a kind of a linear fashion. You've got to kind of pull things in because his mind is just going everywhere. And so here's four places in his teaching that help us identify this feeling of I, 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 things are outside of my control. So chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider this. God has made one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. You can't look back on your life six months, a year in the past, and draw any conclusions about what tomorrow is going to be. Now, you can have some thoughts you think are reasonable or that seem like they're likely to take place. But the truth is, we, we can't figure it out. And that's his point. 
we can't understand where God is going, what His purposes are. And, and we want to think that we can, but, but it's beyond us. That's why He says no one can discover anything about their future. That's what makes fear so difficult to live with because we realize it's out of my control. I can't manipulate things the way I want them. The second verse, and this is chapter 8. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and observe the labor that is done on earth, people getting no sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. His point is, as you're trying to understand his phrase or what goes on under the sun is just his kind of tagline for living life. And he says, if you're honest, you can't add the numbers up and get the answer you think they should add to. You can't get one and two and three and think the answer is six. It's going to be something else because there's probably other numbers that are left out that we aren't able to discern or to see. And so the teacher is telling us, even the smartest person you know, they can't really comprehend it either. Third place where he talks about this in Ecclesiastes, later in chapter 8. Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. At the beginning, their words are folly. At the end, their wicked madness. And fools multiply words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell someone else what will happen after them? And he's, he's saying there that people who, uh, and all of us have known people that the things they say just are just folly. They sound like they are intelligent. They sound like they know what they're talking about. But the teacher says, who can tell someone, who can walk up to someone else and say, let me tell you what your life's going to be like in five years? No, no one can do that. Because no one is able to look into a special set of binoculars that lets you see what the events are going to be when they unfold. And the fourth place where he talks about this, chapter 11. As you do not know the path of the wind, or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Now the teacher is drawing on his experience. We would say, you can get a weather forecast and They'll tell you where the jet stream's going and so forth. Science can tell you how the baby's formed. But in our world, there'll be other things that we would say that we don't know, that we can't understand. And the teacher is saying here, you cannot understand the work of God. It should cause us to have a little bit of humility before we say, well, God is leading me to do this, or God is doing that, or I can see God is up to this that we might want to pause because he says here, you cannot understand the work of God and what he's up to. It's beyond our ability to figure that out looking forward. Now, you can look back and see things and see how his hand was working and so forth, but looking ahead, he says, you, you can't tell. So the teacher's point, if we are honest, there aren't many things that we have real control over in our lives. It's like driving your car, and you, you, you're driving on a windy road, and there's a, you're driving up a hill or something, and, and the road takes a sharp bend, either to the right or to the left, and you can't see around the bend. That's what the teacher's saying. You don't know what's around there. And it creates fear. So what are we supposed to do with that then? Well, a word that the Bible keeps coming back to over and over is the word trust. So if you have a scriptures, go in the scriptures to the New Testament to John chapter 14, where Jesus talks about trust the last night of his life as he's talking to his men. And the reality is, when we face a future that's uncertain and we don't know, 
if the cancer treatment's going to work. We don't know if we're going to get hired at age 55. We don't know at the age of 25 why we can't get pregnant and if we ever will. Where do you put your hope? Where's the trust going to, to land? And what, what is solid enough to bear up under our need to trust? The political season has certainly shown us it's not government. It's not ourselves. I've noticed on Facebook there's this thing going around. I'll see it, or I'll see it on uh, some a news clip, a uh, you know, person on the street thing, where people are thanking the universe, or they're seeking help from the universe. Uh, that they'll they'll say the universe came through in this situation. Uh, on the one hand, that sounds strange to say. On the other hand, I think it's the echo of the created human life that's seeking to want to acknowledge God is out there, but their mind just won't let them. And so they're, they're seeking to place hope in the universe that'll somehow make everything work out. But what does Jesus say to his men on the night Jesus was going to die? Or the day before he's going to die? Chapter 14, verse 1. He's just told them one of them was going to betray him, and he's told them that one of them, namely Peter, was going to deny he knew Jesus. So Jesus says in chapter 14, verse 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. And take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. And so on this night, when, when everything in the disciples' lives is unraveling, and Jesus is going to be arrested in just a few hours, he says to those men, the trust that you have in God, put it in me right now. Trust me. Even though as he's asking them to trust him, he knows in about three hours he will be arrested, he will be put on trial, uh, he'll be beaten, the disciples will scatter. He knows all that's happening, and still he says to them, I want you to trust me. You trust God right now. As everything in your life's unraveling, I want you to trust me. Trust me when you see me arrested. Trust me when you see them run me off. Trust me when you see them threaten you. I want you to trust me. I've got this. Verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. One of the great statements in the Bible where Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I'm asking you to trust me because of who I am. Philip said, well, Lord, show us a father and that will be enough. Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. You can't make that statement unless one of two things is true. Either you are who you say you are in that statement. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Or the person making that statement is, is, is crazy. But you can't make that statement and be human in your right mind. And so Jesus says to Philip, I'm asking you to trust me, Philip, because the person who has seen me has seen God himself. Down below in verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Interesting choice of words. Jesus never said things just to fill in the sentence. Everything he said, every word had meaning. And here he says, I won't leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you in a place where you are scared out of your mind. I'm coming. I will, I will be with you. 
I'm not leaving you as orphans. And so he calls on his men there to trust. And so the same calling on them is our calling when we can't control things and we are scared over the direction we see life going, Jesus calls us to trust him. Think of it this way. Your two-year-old, maybe your child, a daughter or granddaughter, say has a serious brain tumor. And, and many or maybe most people in here have known or heard someone in that situation down at Children's or uh, at some hospital where they're a young child, two or three years old, has some very serious brain tumor that has to be dealt with. And suppose a child is two. The parent is not able, the grandparent is not able to make the child understand what's happening. You have to go through this it's going to be awful. The treatment's going to be hard. It's going to make you sick. You're going to have very hard days. But it's so we can make you well. The parent cannot help a two-year-old understand that. It's beyond the two-year-old's capacity to follow. It's, they can't. They can't possibly understand it. No matter how hard the parent tries, and parents try to do that, it'll be okay, and we're going to be here, and you'll get better. It, it doesn't mean anything to a two-year-old. What is the one thing that will help that two-year-old? It's when mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or whoever holds that child and holds them tight. That's the difference maker. It's when the child comes, is starting to wake up from the surgery and they see mom, they see dad, the first people they see. That's the difference maker. The child's not even asking the questions as a two-year-old that, that to help them understand. It's, they can't even phrase the questions. But they're not looking for answers to questions. They're looking for something that will hold them tight and remind them it's okay. It's okay. That's what the child's looking for. Now, the gap in understanding between a two-year-old and their parent is infinitesimally small compared to the gap that exists between us and the creator of all things whom we are asking, I got to know. Help me figure it out. Uh, people will, will come in my office and they'll ask, they'll ask me, why did this happen? Or why did that happen? whether it's a husband leaving or a child that's just off in a terrible place or an a illness, they'll, they'll ask, why did God do this? And they, they, at times they, they suppose that I can answer that question. Like I've got some sort of direct line to get the answer. Lord, I've got Bill here. We've been talking about this problem in his life. And he wants to know why it's happened and what you're doing. I can't answer him, so I thought I'd ask you, because he wants me to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I tried to explain that, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's what I'll tell him. Put the phone back in my pocket. Yeah, he's not going to tell you. That's, there's this gap, and, and we, can't, we can't know, but what he does say to us is, trust me. Trust me. In Revelation, it was mentioned earlier about Revelation, at the very end. I'm gonna, I want to read it because I want to get it right. Revelation chapter 20. 21. Speaking of the day in which it says the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And in that day, 
because of this gap between us and the Lord is infinitely larger than the gap between a two-year-old and their parent. The two-year-old never ends up asking why anyway. They've recovered. They're bouncing around the house. They're swinging on a swing set. Your two-year-old never sits down and says, okay, I want to know why it happened. They've moved on. They just don't, they don't, they're not, their mind isn't formed that way at that point. And I think the, the implication of what we just read in Revelation is even when we're in the Lord's presence and it says he wipes the tears away, I'm not so sure that we'll be any different than that two-year-old that we won't ask that his presence will be such that I don't need to ask. I'm okay. I'm okay without knowing. And so call the Scripture is to trust. Jesus says to us, I will never, ever, under any circumstance, leave you. I will never abandon you. I will never leave you on your own. I am with you every single moment. See, but it doesn't look like that. And what does the Bible do? It points us in a direction. When we say to ourselves, it doesn't look like he's here. I can't see him. It seems like he's... The Bible says, look at the cross. And on the cross, you will see the depth of God's love and how far he went to secure our eternal life with him. And the cross and the suffering there on our behalf voluntarily is his exhibit A to say, if you aren't sure to trust me, if you don't believe I'll be there, if somehow you think I'll drop the ball, look at the cross. Look at what Jesus did on the cross. And it's him on the cross that then can cause us to say, I will trust you. I don't understand it. I'm worn out. I don't have anything left in the tank. But I will trust. I will look at the cross. And when I see Jesus and how the Bible portrays him and how he helped people, he never left people hanging, how he came to their defense, he tried to be with them when in their heartache, and he helped people whose minds were gone because of demonic oppression, and people who had died and he brought them back to life. What you see in Jesus is everywhere he went, He was trying to improve people's lives. Even his confrontation with the Pharisees where he's reaching out to those men and saying, I'm trying to get you to see how bullheaded you are and you would see how far off you are that you might discover and experience life. He was always trying to move toward people and take them to a better place. That's what the Scriptures call us to trust him. Even when we have no answers and even when life is completely out of our control, The Bible calls us to trust. Not trust in some kind of blind leap of faith, but trust in how the Scriptures reveal Jesus to be and who He claimed to be and how He came to reveal the Father. So the call on our lives, when that's all we can see, it makes no sense, and I'm fearful because my life's out of control, and I can't, I can't, I can't, predict that the outcome's ever going to be any better, Jesus says, trust me. Trust me. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've struggled and dealt with fear in your life, he's asking you today, trust him. Let's take a moment and pray, and, and, and you can do that simply by saying, Lord, I need you, and I need you now. Help me, and he will come to you. So let's pray. Lord, ever since Adam in the Garden of Eden, the first emotion he ever expressed was the emotion of fear. And fear has been our companion in all of our lives ever since. 
Help us, Lord, to see in the Scriptures and how they portray Jesus that we can trust. Even when things don't get better, when things might even get worse, we can trust that you will never abandon your people. That somehow, Lord, you are at work in the midst of the things that seem out of control. You're at work. Help us, Lord, to trust that through your Spirit, as we see what the Bible says about Jesus, that we could say, okay, Lord, I believe that you've got this. And I'll trust you right now. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here who does not know Jesus Christ, that they would see the, the folly of putting trust in some elected official or in, in money or just some blind faith, but they would know that they can trust because we see in Jesus Christ who God is and what he's like. And everywhere Jesus went, he tried to make people's lives better. And we pray, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name, our Savior. Amen.